All right, good morning, everybody. So we ended the last lecture uh, talking about how to add uh, and or subtract uh, two floating point numbers. Um, so just to quickly remind you, um, if we've got two floating point numbers, right, and if when you write them out in their floating point representation, they have the same exponent, uh, then you just add them using um, the arithmetic you were taught in grade school. Right, so 12.1 and 63.8, we can write these out in our floating point representation. They're just 121 times 10 to the minus 1 and 638 times 10 to the minus 1. Uh, so here the exponents match. So that's the important thing, right? So whenever we're summing two numbers, we want to make sure that these two exponents are the same. Uh, so you go, ahead, you go ahead and add them, you get 759 times 10 to the 1, right? Or 75.9, which is the exact result in this case. Right. Similarly here, we've got uh, 81,500 and 13,600, right? Write the numbers out in their floating point representation. They have the same exponent, so I don't have to do anything special. Compute the sum to get 951 times 10 to the 2, right? 95,100, which again is the correct sum. Uh, so in both of these cases here, we've got the exponents uh, of the two numbers. They're the same. When I compute their sums, uh, the sums fit inside three digits. Right? Uh, if the sums don't fit inside three digits, right, then you have to do something to deal with the extra digit. Right? There's actually another question here. Uh, the question that's uh, actually begging to be asked here is, if you only have three digits, how on earth are you computing a result that has four digits in it? So we'll get to that in just a minute. Right? Um, but again, our numbers have the same exponents. Right? Our operands, our two values that we're summing. When you sum them together, if you get four digits in this case, uh, then what you do is, is you round that result so that it only has three digits. Right? So you round that result, sorry, to the nearest tens, right? not to the nearest ones. So the nearest tens, so you get 146, and then adjust the exponent right, to get 146 times 10 to the zero. Right? And so now we have three digits and um, an integer exponent. Right? Notice that the result is not the same as the correct result. Right, we've actually lost, uh, there is uh, some inaccuracy in the result. Right, down here, you get 1751 times 10 to the 2. Right, so I'm going to round to the nearest tens, so that's 175. Right, I'm going to adjust the exponent up by 1 to get 175 times 10 to the 3. Right, again, notice that the uh, end result um, is different than the correct result. Right, it's different because I only have three digits, but the actual answer needs four. Okay, so what happens if you have uh, different exponents? Right? So if you have different exponents, um, to do, uh, in order to, do, to compute the sum, you have to make sure that the exponents have the same value. Right? So 4,320,000 and 12.1, right? So if I was to write these out, I would get uh, 432 times 10 to the 4, right? And 12.1 is uh, 121 times 10 to the minus 1. Right, so four, three, two, so four, three, two, zero, 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 zero. Right, convert that to floating point. You get uh, four, three, two, ten to the what is it? Ten to the four, and then twelve point one is one twenty one, ten to the minus one. Right, so those exponents are different. So the rule here is that you have to take the smaller exponent and make it be the same as the larger exponent. Right, so now I have to convert. So I need to make this 10 to the minus 1. Right, and so to do that, uh, sorry, 10 to the, what am I doing? I have to make that 10 to the 4. Right, which means I have to adjust this number by five decimal places. Right, so I'm going to get 0, 0, 1, 2, 1, right? Yeah, 0 0.00121 times 10 to the 4. Right? And now I can add these two values. I can add those two results, uh, those two numbers, sorry, there. Right? Which is what the slide is showing you up there. Right? So compute the sum now, as it's shown on the slide, and you get 432.00121 times 10 to the 4. Right? Again, remember, I only have three digits in our representation, so I can't keep anything after the decimal place. Right? So again, you can just apply the rule. You're going to round in this case, to the nearest ones, right? So when I round that, that's 432 times 10 to the 4. 
right? uh, which again is not the same as the original result. Right? Also notice what has happened here. Right? You've computed x plus y, right? where x and y, they both have an exact representation in our floating point format. Right? x is 432 times 10 to the 4, y is 121 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? Those, are both valid val uh, those are both values that we can represent exactly in this format. Right? But when you compute x plus y, you end up getting back x. Right? So you have x plus y equals x, where y is not equal to 0, which mathematically doesn't make any sense. <coughs> but that's one of the consequences of using this representation. Right? So the results that you get um, when computing arithmetic in, uh, on a computer using floating point, uh, or using this particular floating point representation, Right? They d it does not necessarily give you back the mathematical result. Right? And you end up in situations that are mathematically illogical. Or you can end up in situations that are mathematically illogical. OK, so in order to do this sort of thing um, on your actual CPU, right? Right? so in, o in other words, in order to write this out using, uh, so that the exponents are the same, right? uh, one of two things has to happen. Right? Either when you try to whoops, sorry, either when you try to write out this number, right, you just get rid of everything after the decimal point so that I only I still only have three digits. Right? Or somewhere on your CPU, your CPU has to be able to hold these extra uh, these extra digits. Right? So back in the early days of computing, um, it wasn't always feasible to use extra digits in the computation. Right. On modern CPUs, um, th this is done now. Right. So on a modern CPU, there are extra digits that are um, on your. C there are extra digits in the numbers when your uh, CPU computes arithmetic. Right. But in the early days, there wasn't. So if I had to compute uh, a sum or a difference in floating point, right? However many digits we had, that's how many. That's how many digits you could use. Right. So if we don't have these extra digits. Uh, then what you're stuck with is discarding digits. Right? You can't even round, right? because you need that one extra digit to do the rounding. So now everything just gets discarded. Right? Anything that you can't hold in those digits, you just throw it away. Right? So now if I compute this sum, right, and I don't have any extra digits to work with, right, y becomes 0 times 10 to the 4. Right? Because I can't represent, I can't write that down. Uh, because I don't have those digits after the decimal point. Right? And so now you end up computing the sum and you get uh, 432 times 10 to the 4. Right? So that's the same as the previous slide. So it looks like maybe there's not a problem here. Right? Even though I got rid of the extra digits, I still had the same result as if I kept those extra digits. Right? Of course, the final answer is still wrong, but, or still not exact. Um, but it looks like it may not cause any problems. Unfortunately, that's not true. So if you don't have those extra digits, then when you compute a sum or a difference, right, you can end up with answers that have very large results. Uh, sorry, very large errors. So 10.5 minus 9.98. Right? Observe again, I can write 10.5 out exactly in our representation. Right? It's just 105 times 10 to the minus 1. 9.98, I can also write out exactly. Right? It's 998 times 10 to the minus 2. Right. But when I convert it, it's exponent so that it's the same as the larger value. Right? I'm going to lose the 8. Right? So it's uh, 998 times 10 to the minus 2. Right? If I change the exponent to minus 1, it's 99.8 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? I'm no longer holding the extra digit, so I'm stuck with 99. Right? Now compute the difference. Right, so that's 6 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? If I scale that back up so that the 6 is in the first digit, that's 600 times 10 to the minus 3. Right? If you actually compute the true result, right, you get, uh, it's actually uh, 0 0.52. Right? You, can do that. you should be able to do that in your head. Right? The, act, the true result is 0 0.52, which is 520 times 10 to the minus 3. Right? If I compare the 600 and the 520, their exponents are the same. Right? I can compute the number of ulps of error. Right? It's just 600 minus 520. Right? And that's 80 ulps 
of error, um, which is enormous if you look at the standard that governs floating point arithmetic, right? IEEE 754 says if you compute uh, any arithmetic value, any uh, arithmetic value computed using two uh, floating point numbers should always produce a result that is within one half an ulp of the correct answer. Right? So if I don't have extra digits, I can't satisfy the standard. Right? No extra digits, 80 ulps of error. I have to be within one half an ulp. Right? That's another, that's 160. I'm off by a factor of 160, right? which is not good. Right? Okay, so what's the solution? All right, so the solution is, well, it looks like I need extra digits. So suppose I am allowed to use one extra digit. Right? And I'm gonna, that extra digit is to the right of the decimal point. Right? So I can hold one extra digit here. Right? And so that extra digit is what's called a guard digit. Right? So now if I use one extra digit to compute the result, right, I can now write that 8 down. Right? So I can now write 9.8 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? Again, remember that when we're doing this, uh, the reason we're doing this is because when I compute uh, this sum or difference, I have to make sure that these two exponents are the same. So now when I compute the result, I get 5.2 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? I'm allowed to hold that fourth digit, so I can hold the point 0.2 now. Right? And now I can convert that 5.2 uh, back to its correct floating point representation. Right? Remember, I'm not, allowed, I'm not allowed to have a 0 in the first place. Right? So I, re I correct that to make that 520 times 10 to the minus 3. And now I have the correct answer. Right? So that's good. Right? I, I'm within, uh, I now have the exact answer. I'm, not, I'm, better than, I'm better than one half an ulp error. Right? I have the exact answer. So it turns out that uh, one extra digit is not sufficient. Right? So here's an example where I'm computing 110 minus 8.59. Right? The correct answer is 101.41. When you crunch through all the math, right? so convert uh, 110 to floating point, so it's that, right? I'm allowed to use one extra digit, so there's something after the decimal point, right? Compu uh, convert 8.59, right? Now, when I convert the 8.59, I run into another problem, right? So uh, 8.59 is 859 times 10 to the minus 2, right? But I need to make that minus 2 be the same as a 0. Right, so I have to convert that to 8.59 times 10 to the 0. Right. So the problem with the 8.59 is I don't have that second extra digit. Right. All I've got is one extra digit. Right. So you end up with 8.5. Right. You drop the, the 9. So now when you compute the difference, it's 102 times 10 to the 0. Right? And if you compute the difference between 102 and 101.41, right, you'll get 0 0.59, right, which is greater than 1 half ulp error. Right? So that one extra digit is not sufficient for addition or subtraction. Right? You need at least two. Yes? Convert back to binary. So, no, so everything, yeah, everything still applies, right? So if, if you're doing all of this as binary arithmetic instead, you'll still run into, the, you'll, real, you'll come into, you'll run into the same problem. You still can't meet the one half alt error requirement. So you need at least two for, uh, for addition and subtraction. I don't know how many you need for division or multiplication, right? It could be different, I'm not sure. All right, so you need at least two guard digits if you're doing um, a, uh, addition or subtraction. Um, I think on your, what does Intel use? Uh, so Intel, I think they use a total of 80 binary digits in their floating point arithmetic. All right, so floating point, uh, so doubles are 64 bits. Uh, I'm pretty sure on an Intel CPU, they use a total of 80 bits to compute the result. Uh, and so you actually have 16 extra, 16? Yeah, 16 extra digits um, to compute the result on an Intel CPU. Okay, so subtracting, to, uh, so 
Um, something else happens when you're working with floating point numbers uh, and you're doing arithmetic and you're doing subtraction. Right? Uh, so what you have to remember is that whenever you do any floating point operation, there's going to be there's probably going to be some error in the computed result. Right? Unfortunately, if you're doing subtraction, the magnitude of that error can become very large. Right? So if you take two floating point values that are close together, right? so they have the similar magnitude, uh, when you subtract them, uh, you could end up with a lot of error. Right? So here I've got 10 digits right, in my two numbers. Right? I'm going to subtract them. They're only different in the last two digits. Right? One, di one number ends in 90. The last one ends in 89. If I subtract those two values, right? I get all zeros and a one times 10 to the zero, right? So notice what's gone, notice what has happened here, right? There's no error in the result, right? But how many significant digits are in that result, right? Well, everything's zero except for one digit. So there's one significant digit in the result, right? But your X and Y, they both had 10 significant digits. Right? So you've actually lost nine, you potentially lose up to nine significant digits in this example. Right. Okay, so this phenomenon, when you subtract two values and you lose all these significant digits, right, this is called cancellation. Right? Because the, all of the digits over here, right, they've all become zero. Right? So they all cancel one another out. Right? Those are called the high order digits. Right? Why are they the high order digits? Because they're the ones that contribute most to the magnitude of the original number. Right? That one is more important to the overall magnitude of x than that zero, right? or the nine. Right? Because these, when, uh, these, are, these represent numbers raised to a higher exponent. Right? So when you subtract two numbers, you always end up with cancellation. Right? It's not always, uh, I mean, that's inevitable, right? That's just the way subtraction is defined. Uh, you lose all the high order bits or all the high order digits. The result, if you don't get zero, right, you end up with, uh, the result is typically, you only end up with the lower order digits, right? The, oops, sorry, the stuff down here, right? So those are your lower order, uh, your low order digits. Okay, so if the two numbers have no error, then you don't care, right? This is just how subtract. This is just how subtraction works, right? So if there's no error in the in the numbers, then you get what's called benign cancellation, right? Yes, all my digits became zero, but the answer is still correct, right? Uh, so if there's a benign cancellation, there's also something called catastrophic cancellation, right? And so catastrophic cancellation occurs when you subtract two values that are close in magnitude. But they one or more, uh, sorry, one or both of the values, they contain some error. Right? So when might they contain some error? Right? Well, they contain some error if the original number that was input can't be converted to uh, can't be converted to floating point exactly, or if you take two exact floating point numbers and you compute something with them, right? Then that result will probably contain some floating point error. Right? So this is the uh, b squared minus 4ac, right? That's, your, that's the part in the uh, square root of the quadratic equation. Right. So I'm going to compute b squared minus 4ac, where b is equal to that, a is equal to that, and c is equal to that, right? So again, notice a, b, and c, they all have an exact representation in our floating point format, right? They all have three digits. So if I pull out my calculator, right, and compute the exact result, you get the following, right? You get uh, 292 times 10 to the minus four, right? 0 0.0292 is the, is, the, uh, is the magnitude of b squared minus four ac, right? What's important here is that b squared and the four ac, uh, they, their values are similar, right? 11.1556 and 11.1264, right? The other part that's important here is that, right? That thing in there has six digits in it. That's got six digits in it. I only have three digits to work with. Right? So when I convert these two numbers to our floating point representation, I'm going to run into a problem. Right? Okay, so let's compute uh, b squared minus 4ac now using our floating point representation. 
right? And I'm going to, I'm even going to cheat in this case, right? So when I compute b squared, I'm going to use all six digits of the number, and then I'm going to round it, right? Round it back to three digits, so one, one, two, right? I'm not going to throw away the digits. If I throw away the digits, the result's even worse. So I'm going to round it instead, right? And I get 112 times 10 to the minus one, right? Why do I have to do this? Because I only have three digits to work with, right? So I can't keep that 556. Right? Now compute 4ac. Right? Again, I'm going to cheat. Right? I'm not going to compute 4 times a, convert the result to floating point, and then multiply it by c. Right? I'm just going to compute 4ac on my calculator and round the result. Right? If you were to compute 4 times a, convert to floating point, then times c, the result is even worse. Right? So now I get 111 times 10 to the minus 1. Right? So now I can subtract the 112 and the 111, and I get 1 times 10 to the minus 1, right? Which is 100 times 10 to the minus 3, right? And now flip back to the previous slide, right? The correct answer is 292 times 10 to the minus 4, right? That digit is wrong, that digit's wrong, that digit's wrong, and the exponent's wrong. Everything's wrong, <laughs> right? It's all wrong, right? That number is very different than that number there, right? How different is it? It's 708 ohms of error, right? So remember what, I, what, remember what the standard says, right? The standard says if you compute, uh, a simple, if you compute two uh, arithmetic using two values, you should always be within one half an open error, right? So when I compute that, I should be within a half ulp error, right? And I am, if I compute that, uh, I should be within, well, let's call it a half open error. That's not exactly true, but let's call it that, right? And then when I compute the difference, I should again be within a half open error. But the final result is not, right? It's 708 ohms of error, right? And that's very large, right? Uh, so if, you're, if you are computing, uh, so when you do subtraction with floating point numbers, right, uh, there is the possibility uh, so when the numbers have roughly the same magnitude, right, uh, you have to be prepared for the fact that the correct, the actual answer, the answer that you get may be very far off from the correct answer, right? Now there is something you should keep in mind, right? That's still, so remember b squared minus 4ac, so their values are roughly the same, so the difference should be roughly zero, right? That number is still small, right? It's still 0.1, right? That number is small, right? That's 0 0.03, right? Something like that, right? Uh, so they're both close to zero. It's just that the computed result is very far off from the true result, right? If all that you care about is that the answer is close to zero, then this isn't really a problem, right? Uh, but if for some reason you actually need the exact result, uh, this could become problematic. Okay, so in, if you're reading the notebooks, there is a fairly large chunk of the notebook that talks about uh, how you can sometimes avoid catastrophic cancellation, right? So if you're computing some result with some formula, right, it may be the case that you can transform the formula so that the subtraction disappears, right? And so the uh, notebook actually works through some examples of, uh, when, uh, some examples where you can do this, right? For the average programmer, these are meaningless, right? You're never gonna run into these situations, right? For people who are working in scientific applications or, or who are writing libraries for other people who are working on scientific applications, right? This sort of thing becomes useful. The average programmer doesn't care about this, right? And when you look at the examples in the notebooks, you'll realize very quickly why the average programmer doesn't care about this. It's because you're never gonna encounter these equations in real life uh, in a typical non-scientific application, right? If you're interested, look in that notebook. Okay, but here is an example where, oh, sorry, question. Um, this catastrophic cancellation, does that problem at least get minimized when using many, many guard digits? Many, many guard digits. Uh, you can always, yes, you can always reduce the error, the error. Well, sorry, so does it get, no. So remember what happens, right? So no matter how many guard digits you have, you have to convert that back to your floating point representation, right? So at some point you still end up with up to half an open error uh, every time you do this, right? And so if you do this a bunch of times, your final result could have more error than you want, yeah. Which I'm gonna show you right now, actually. 
OK, so every, so every basic floating point operation has up to a half open error. Right? So if you have to repeat an operation many times, that error can accumulate. Right? And so you might ask, well, when am I ever, gonna when am I ever going to repeat an arithmetic calculation? Right? So an example is if you have a bunch of numbers and you want to take the average, right? which is not at all unusual uh, these days. Right? I want to do some sort of statistic, compute an average, compute a standard deviation, something like that. Right? That all involves summing um, one or more numbers. Right? If you're working with uh, large sample sizes, uh, which is quite common now, right? the potential for round off error, uh, the potential for this sort of uh, error um, gets worse. Right? And I'm going to show you what is perhaps a slightly um, surprising example here. Let me, I'm just going to flip to Eclipse and show you this. It's the exact same as what's on the slide. OK, so here I've got a little program. I'm going to sum uh, 1,001 values. Okay. And I'm going to use float in this example. Right, so remember, float is the smaller version of double. Uh, I'm using float because it's, uh, it's easier to get a large error with float than it is to get one with double. Right? With double, I'd have to sum more numbers. So I'm going to use float instead. OK, so what values am I going to put into this array? Right. I'm going to put, I'm going to use arrays fill, and I'm going to fill that array up with 0 0.1. Right. So I have 1,001 0 0.1s. Right. And then I'm going to change uh, the first number to a million. So I'm going to sum a million plus 1,000 point 1.1s. Right. 1,000 times point 0.1 is 100. Right. So the sum should be 1,100,000. So I'm going to start my sum out at 0. How do I sum the values? Well, I just write a little loop. Right? I can use a for each loop. You can use a counting loop. It doesn't matter. Right? So for each value in the array, add it to the sum, right? and then print the sum. Run the program. Right? I get 1,125. Right? I can't even sum 1,000 numbers correctly. Right? I should get 1,100,000. I'm off by 25 which is kind of surprising if you think about it, right? Can't even add 1,000 numbers properly. In this case, there's an easy solution, right? So the solution here is, so notice the difference between these two slides, right? It's the line that's in red, right? There's only one difference, right? If I take that million and move it to the end of the array, the problem goes away, right? So I'm going to now move it to the end of the array. So instead of array 0 equals a million, I'm going to write array.length minus 1 is now the million. Right? So now I have 1,000 point 1s in front, the millions at the end. And lo and behold, you get the correct result. Right? So what's going on here? Right? So what's going on here is that in the previous example, right, what's the first sum that you compute? The first sum that you compute is? Right. So the very first sum that you end up computing is a million plus 0 0.1. Right? And that number is much, much bigger than that number there. So when you add these two numbers, right, you can't represent all of that 0.1 in the sum, because right? that number's magnitude is much larger. Right? And so as soon as you do that sum, you lose part of that 0.1. Right? And now you've got a number that's still roughly a million. Right? And now you're going to add 0.1. Right? That number is a lot smaller than that number there. So you're going to lose part of that number in the sum. And that just keeps on going uh, all the way to the end of the array. Right? If you flip it around, the first sum you get is 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1. Right? They have the same exponent. So when you compute that result, the error is very small. Right? And you keep on going. So remember what's happening here, right? So this sum is still computed with one half an ulp error, right? But an ulp for that is much bigger than one ulp here, right? So yes, the sum is a half an ulp, but it's in half an ulp relative to a million.
right? The sum here is half an ulp of error, has half an ulp of error, but it's the ulp relative to 0 0.1, which is much smaller than an ulp that's up here. Right? Uh, and so what you'll often see if you search on the internet, how do I compute a sum to minimize the round off error? Right? A lot of people will tell you almost certainly the first thing that shows up is, right, is do, 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 sorting. Right? People will say, oh, just sort the array or list and then compute the, uh, and then sum. Right? If you sort the array or list, then what tends to happen is numbers with the same magnitude get grouped together. Right? So when you compute the sum, that tends to minimize the error. Right? Why shouldn't you do this? Right? Because sorting, right? even our best sorting algorithms, they have complexity O n log n. Right? What is the operation that I'm actually trying to compute here? Well, I'm trying to compute a sum. Right, of n numbers, right? The sum should have a, compute the sum, I should be able to do that in O n, with O n complexity, right? If I sort first, right, I now have worse complexity. Right? The other problem is, is that you end up changing the order of the values in the array or list, right? Uh, which may not be desirable or even possible um, depending on your application, right? So for example, the order of the values in your list or array, that might be significant to you, right? If I sort it, the order changes, and that might not be uh, something that you want to do, right? So now I have to copy the array or list, right? And that's an extra on uh, uh, time to do the copy. So it turns out some, whoa, sorry. Uh, someone actually managed to figure out uh, how can you compute the sum and still minimize the error without sorting. Right? And so that algorithm is called Cahan's algorithm. Uh, it's also in the floating point uh, error notebook if you're interested in how it works. Right? I'm not going to describe it here, and I'm not going to ask you about it either. Cahan is one of the principal architects of the IEEE 754 standard, uh, former U of T professor. Okay, so that's all I want to talk about. That's plenty to talk about in a first year course for floating point uh, numbers. Right? Um, what you have to keep, uh, so there are some things to keep in mind about this topic, right? So whenever you're working with floating point numbers, right, you have to be aware of the fact that there might be some error in your computed result. For most applications, the error probably doesn't matter, right? Um, especially if you're using double, because uh, double's got 64 bits uh, to store the, to, hold, to represent the number, right? Probably doesn't matter in most cases. Um, but if you're somebody who is uh, writing applications for uh, writing some sort of scientific application, right? And especially if you're writing libraries for other people who are, might reuse your code, right? This is when you have to start to really dig into how does floating point, num how does floating point arithmetic actually work and how do I minimize errors when working with them? Right? Uh, if, you're, if you end up in the financial industry of some sort, right? Uh, in finance, right, with at least the North American uh, monetary system, uh, you have uh, dollars and cents, right? So you have fractional values, right? If you end up in that situation, you're almost certainly going to end up using a specialized type that deals with computing uh, arithmetic with uh, monetary amounts, right? And it's all because you want to avoid the errors that might occur when you're using um, the floating point standard. All right, so that's all I want to say about uh, floating point um, arithmetic on your computer. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next set of slides. All right. So this is an object-oriented programming course, so we're finally going to get around to creating and using objects. All right. So you can write a Java program using nothing but the primitive types. All right. That is definitely that's certainly possible. It would be very painful, right? but it's certainly possible. Right. Uh, so in other words, you can write a computer program using only Boolean int and double, for example. Right. Uh, you wouldn't want to. Right. So almost any non-trivial Java program is going to make use of what are called objects that interact with one another. Right. Now the question is, is why do you want to use objects? Right. It's because uh, with, if you use objects, right, your objects, they can perform operations for you, right? They have methods that you can call, right? Instead of having to do all the work yourself, right? 
So they can perform many more operations than you can perform just using primitive values. Okay, so what's inside of an object, right? Or what is the structure in ob of an object? Right? So an object contains information, right? It it, typically, an object holds data, right? Where does it hold data? Well, it's got some variables, right? Uh, and so in uh, Java, uh, the language refers to those variables as fields, right? Uh, you might also see the word instance variable, right? Instance is just the same thing as object, right? Okay, so the information that an object holds it can hold primitive type information, int double boolean, right? Or it can actually hold references to other objects, right? So you can have an object and inside that object is a string, right? So a person object might have a name, for example, that's a string, right? So in other words, you can have an object, right? It's made up of other objects, which is made up of other objects, which is made up of other objects, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? So it's possible to build very complex, um, very complex objects, right? Okay. So if you look at your variables that your object has, right, and you look at the values for all of those variables, right, that's just called the state of the object, right? So it's just the values of all the variables that belong to the object. So we say that an object has state. Right? If you have two different objects, they can have different state, and that's useful. Right? Just like two different int variables can have two different int values. Right? So objects contain information, and they can perform actions. Right? So the methods that belong to an object, they define what actions the object can perform. Right? So in other words, objects can perform computation. The way that you perform the comp the way that you ask the object to perform the computation is to call a method. Right? Now, if that object knows about other objects, it can ask other objects to do some work for it. Right? So objects can ask other objects to do things for them. Right? And thus you end up with a Java program that can uh, that consists of a bunch of objects that interact with one another. Okay, so to use an object, uh, you need to create an object. Right? So an object is born, right? You make the object and then you use it for some reason, right? So you make a string and then you, perhaps to hold the name of a student, right? You use the string for something and then eventually you no longer need that object anymore, right? So the life cycle of an object is creation or birth, right? It's lifetime where it's used and then eventually uh, it goes away, right? So it gets destroyed. Objects occupy they have information, so that means they occupy memory, right? And so you have to, when you're done with the object, you have to get rid of the object so that you can get back the memory that the object was using, right? If you don't get rid of the memory, then uh, you eventually run out of memory on your computer, right? So on ja in Java, you can control the creation, right? Obviously, you can control how you use it, right? You don't care about the destruction. Well, you normally don't care about how it's destroyed, right? So the programmer explicitly creates an object, explicitly uses an object, but never explicitly destroys an object. Right? The language uh, takes care of removing objects from memory when they're no longer needed. OK, so step one, you need to make an object. Whenever you make an object, every object is almost always created using uh, new. Right? You might call a method that returns another object. Right? So all of the string methods return new objects. Right? And so you end up with a new object, but it looks like you never called new. That's because the method is calling new for you. Right? So the new operator is the thing uh, that uh, causes an object to be, to be born. Right? It actually does three things. Right? So an object, object occupies memory. So new allocates memory for the object. Now, every object has state, right? It has values for its variables. So the new operator calls what's called a constructor for the object. That constructor initializes the state of the new object. Right? So it sets the values of all the variables for the object. Right? And then finally, it returns a reference to the newly allocated object. Right? So allocates memory causes the initialization to happen. It doesn't do the initialization, right? It causes the initialization to happen. Something else does the initialization. And then it returns a reference to the new object. 
right? So for example, uh, if you're looking in the course notebooks, there's a point two class. Uh, if you have the source code uh, for the course, you can find the source code in this package here. So uh, the point two class is just a two-dimensional point, right? So x and y, so it's a two-dimensional point on, uh, in, in uh, Cartesian space, right? So it has an x and a y coordinate. Uh, x and y are both double values, right? So it's roughly a real point uh, in two dimensions. Right? So here's an example of using new three different ways. Well, sorry, new is used the same way, um, but it calls a different constructor each time. Right? So if I want to make three different point objects, so I want to make a point object P1, so I make a point variable, big P.2. Right? To make the point object, I write new, and then I call a constructor. Right? The constructor always has the same name as the uh, uh, very, as the type on the left-hand side, at least for now, right? So if I want to make a new point two object, then the name of the constructor is the same as the class, right? So point two is the class, so point two is the name of the constructor. Right? This particular constructor has no arguments, right? So new point two round bracket round bracket, right? And that turns out uh, it turns out that that constructor initializes the point so that its coordinates are zero and zero. Right, so you, you're at the origin. There is a second constructor in the point two class. Right, it takes in two double values. Right, that's the x coordinate, that's the y coordinate of the point. So you end up with a second point whose coordinates are one and point five. Right, these two points are different points. Right, they're two distinct objects. Right, they have their own state. Right, so that's zero point zero, that's one and one and zero point five. Right? If I change the coordinates of one of the two points, the other one doesn't change. Right? So in other words, these two objects, they're not linked to one another at all. Right? They don't know about each other. The third one, right, there's a third constructor. Right? So notice what its argument, what the argument to the constructor call is. Right? It's P2. Right? So that third constructor, sorry, that third constructor, right, its parameter uh, is another point two object. And so what this constructor does is it copies the state of the object that's referred to by P2, right? So the third constructor copies uh, the point P2, so we end up with a second point whose coordinates are 1.0 and 0 0.5, right? So three points in total, right? The coordinates of these two points are equal, but these are two different points, right? If I change this point, that point doesn't change, right? They are distinct, yes? Uh, is it a special uh, feature of point two that you can use uh, one variable, like one point two object, instead of like, constructing another one? It is. Two no, it is. So uh, the uh, there, what's the best way to put this? So when you're using a class, uh, you have to look at the documentation for the class to see which constructors are offered by the class. Right, uh, you, a class does not have to provide a constructor that has no arguments. It does not have to provide a constructor that has, that accepts the name of the class as a type, right? This, the, these two constructors actually have special names that we'll get to later in the course, right? That's the no argument constructor. That's the copy constructor, right? Uh, when you make a class, you can include these constructors, but you are not obligated to include these constructors. Uh, so I threw this slide in a few years ago uh, just as an example of using a different type, right? So there's this type called scanner. Most, most, a lot of introductory Java courses, especially high school or grade school courses, will use this class. It's because it lets you read the keyboard. Uh, anybody writing software in the real world is not using this class, <laughs> no, right? No one makes a program where you type stuff in in the keyboard into a console. Uh, at least very few people make that sort of software nowadays. Right, so this is just an example, right? Don't worry about the scanner class itself, okay? It's just an example of using it. So if I wanna make a scanner object that can read the keyboard, the way you do it is write new, scanner, and then this thing called system.in, right? If you wanna make a scanner that can read parts of a string, 
right? Make a string and then write new scanner pass in the string, right? And then the scanner's got a bunch of methods that can split this input up, right? So if you wanted to, you could get the string one and then fish and then two and then fish from the scanner, right? Similarly, if you're reading the keyboard, right, you can get the first word that the user typed in, then the second word and so on and so on and so forth, right? Again, don't worry about the scanner class, <laughs> right? This is just an example of creating objects. Okay, when you use new, you must always call a constructor, right? So it's always the same pattern, right? New something, where the something is the name of a class, right? It's actually the name of the constructor, but the name of the constructor is the same as the name of the class, right? So it's always new something. It looks like a method call, so there's always round brackets, right? So the new operator is always followed by a constructor call, right? Calling a constructor looks like calling a method, right? Uh, the Java language says a constructor is not a method. So that's just the way it is, right? Looks like a method, it's not a method, right? Uh, one of the reasons it's not a method is because um, constructors never return a value, right? They don't even return void, right? So it looks like a method, use it like a method, it doesn't return anything, right? That's why you need new in front of it, right? New returns the reference to the created object. Okay, so where are your constructors? Well, they're defined in the class that you are, uh, they're defined in uh, the class that you're using, right? The name of the constructor must exactly match the name of the class, right? That is the rule. If you put something in that doesn't match the name of the class, it's not a constructor, right? What is the constructor used for? It has one purpose and it's very important, right? It is to initialize the state of the newly created object. Right, so it's the thing that sets the values for your object, it sets the values of the variables that your object has when it's born. I guess I should stop there before, because uh, it's already past quarter after. Um, so I'll stop there, we'll pick this up on Monday, I guess. All right. uh, if you haven't seen it, assignment two is out. Um,